Hey. Hi. Should I should I share my screen? Are we gonna wait a little bit? Um. Yeah, I think it's typical to wait a little bit. Um. You could go ahead and share your screen to make sure everything works and stuff, though. Host disabled participant screen. <laughs> uh okay it does look like i'm a host so i can hopefully help with that i'm just gonna make you a co-host cool Can you see my slides? No. Giving me a weird thing. I just changed the settings so that all participants can share. I don't know if that will hopefully like change anything. I'm clicking share and it seems not to be doing anything. Cool. Um, um, do you wanna try leaving the meeting and coming back in? Zoom for Linux though is terrible, so I can't say I'm that surprised. Try again. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna try to join from my browser. That's weird. Oh, okay. All right, um, can you give me his privileges again? I think you should still have them because I think now everyone can share. No? I, I don't see the button. I don't see the button. <laughs> I, used, I used to see the button. I don't see the button anymore. Okay, uh, I just made you okay. a co-host. Did that help? Yeah, no. now I see it, yeah. Okay. Ooh, okay, it worked. So Yay. crappy browser zoom for the win, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Good. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know. We can give people like a couple of minutes to filter in, I guess, and then I'll introduce you and then you can give your talk. Um, I just a heads up, I have a conflict. I think I'll make it for your whole talk, but I might have to leave during the Q&A. So don't, please don't be offended. It's okay. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you've heard most of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what Jesse said. He's like, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with like a lot of, <laughs> like very familiar with a lot of them. Yeah, but exactly. It's still, yeah. Standing tables are the best. Standing desk. <laughs> yeah, for giving also remote talks, talks particularly. Burn. Yeah, exactly. I have a really nice view. It's awesome. There's still snow here, though. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We like never <laughs> got snow fun. here this winter. It never stuck even like overnight, I think. Oh. Very jealous. I like snow. But yeah, I get if it's like the end of March, almost April, that's when I don't like snow. So yeah. It's like the it's like the end of the of the winter and everyone's just like tired. <laughs> yeah. And then the snow that is left is like disgusting. Like the trash and poop is starting to emerge. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, oh, there's, let me, I should at least probably see the chat. Okay, Clara saying she didn't have to shovel even once this year. Me either, the one time it snowed and like maybe I would have shoveled, I was out of town, it was great. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm super excited to introduce Sasha Lucioni. Um, so um, she's a research scientist and climate lead at Hugging Face. She's a board member of Women in Machine Learning or WIML um, and one of the founding members of Climate Change AI. Um, which is a global initiative that aims to catalyze impactful work and build a community at the intersection of climate change and machine learning. Um, you know, her work has centered around um, better understanding of the societal and environmental impacts of AI technologies. Um, and so she's well known in this area. Um, she's been called upon, you know, to provide expert consulting by organizations such as the OECD, the United Nations, um, and NERPS, the conference. Um, to help develop norms and best practices for sustainable and ethical AI. Um, her research, of course, has been published in lots of prestigious conferences and journals, um, including, uh, yeah, IEEE, IEEE, ACM, and Nature Machine Intelligence. Um, and her work has also been covered um, by news outlets, um, including MIT Technology Review, Wired, The Washington Post, and Business Insider. Um, yeah, so I'll let her take it away and talk to us about um, some of those topics. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm going to skip my presentation, but if any of you have any questions about climate change AI or Wimmel or, or Hugging Face or anything that I don't talk about, because I mean, it's more or less uh, related to what I'm saying, don't hesitate to ask uh, at the end. It doesn't have to be related to, to this presentation. Um, so I want to start with this paper. It was like, like a, a, a big, I guess, turning point in my life. Um, Point. Um, I was actually working at Morgan Stanley, so um, wholly miserable, um, but, uh, and I really, really wanted to make a change. And um, I met some people here in Montreal who like, were working on, on this paper and uh, in, in general, in, in terms of uh, like climate change and machine learning. And then I realized that this was um, an, uh, a possibility, I guess, that uh, you didn't have to be miserable on Wall Street, that you could actually do kind of positive uh, environmentally beneficial things with machine learning. And um, before I met these people, I was gonna like quit my job and go teach uh, kindergartners how to compost or I went through a bunch of different options. But in, in any case, I kind of quit my job. I went to, to work at Mila and I contributed to writing this paper. And um, we also started Climate Change AI. So it's like a, a nonprofit and we bring together people who are essentially interested in this and who wanna learn, want to do research, want to do you know, uh, even startups and things like that. So essentially we've created this uh, kind of hub. And um, it's really interesting because you get to see both uh, from inside and from outside what's happening in the field um, of, I guess, climate change and, and sustainability and, and the intersection with AI and machine learning. Um, and what's happened since, what I see a lot um, and what's kind of driven my research in the last couple of years is that there's much more AI research in general, right? Uh, it's becoming more um, accessible, more uh, practiced, more widely practiced in academia and industry. We've seen much bigger AI models, especially in recent years. Um, we've also seen AI products and companies, which is interesting. I mean, like really, you know, AI first uh, in, in terms of products. Um, but what's often overlooked are their impacts on the planet. And so in the last couple of years, I really started looking into like, okay, uh, there's people doing really cool work, uh, both in terms of, you know, in the AI and climate change field, but also in general in society and natural language processing, et cetera. How can we measure the impacts, uh, especially on the planet of, of these models? And so there's kind of three aspects I want to talk about uh, today, uh, starting with data um, about this, then to look at specific models, and then to kind of zoom out and look at broader impacts on the work we're doing, um, hugging face within my team and with uh, other people in the community. And so starting with data, I mean, um, a frustration I had, I mean, Emma's paper came out and people started uh, reporting their carbon emissions, but it's, it was still such a small sample of work in our community. And so I started getting really, really frustrated because I would talk to someone and they'd either think that carbon footprint of AI wasn't a problem or was a huge problem, but it was, you know, it was very anecdotal. And so a couple of years ago, um, I started gathering data for this project called 
counting carbon. And essentially uh, what we did is we took a sample of 500 papers um, in different tasks published in the last like almost 10 years. Uh, and then um, I got the email of every first author by hand, actually, by like searching their email, their uh, websites and things like that. And so I tracked down the email and then essentially I sent them emails asking to provide missing training details. So right, like this paper came out, I even uh, contacted, uh, you know, like people um, who were training AI models in, in 2012, like Alex and things like that. I, I contacted them asking like, how is this model trained? Where it was trained? How many GPUs did you use? How long? And, and essentially like, tell me about the, the training setup. And so sadly, we, we were only able, able to get uh, information for 95 models out of the 500. Um, so only 15%, but still we got a good sample of named entity recognition, question answering and object detection models uh, from 2012 to 2021. And so, uh, I mean, some people replied that they couldn't provide information, that it was proprietary and others they didn't keep the logs so it wasn't necessarily that people didn't want to give us the information it was just like you know especially for the older papers it was really hard to get the exact details and the research questions that we had were where is the energy coming from so you know if we, like what's powering ai or, or machine learning um what are the orders of magnitude of co2 emissions are we talking about five cars in our lifetimes are we talking about you know zero cars what like where are we on this um what are, uh, how do they evolve over time? So, I mean, naively we were thinking that, you know, it just, it, it just kept going up since 2012. Um, and also, uh, is it, you know, is it always true that using more energy and uh, emitting more CO2 leads to better model performance? Because like, you know, the bigger, bigger it is better hypothesis, I guess. Um, and just as a side note, there's like no single uh, agreed upon way to estimate carbon emissions. People tend to do it in, in a bunch of different ways. What we tried to do in order to kind of stay um, reproducible and, and simple uh, was to take three factors. So the power consumption of the hardware, and this is kind of like a theoretical measure. So uh, in order to get the actual power consumption, you would need to like be tracking uh, in real time when you're training a model, um, how, much, how much energy you're using, then the training time and uh, the carbon intensity of the energy grid. So people um, told us locations, either cloud locations, so like US East or like actually like Seattle, Washington. And so we also, we consulted um, like either international or national or regional uh, carbon intensities and at the time of the model training and got the carbon intensity of the energy grid, which, which essentially depends on how the energy is produced, right? So essentially that's how we um, estimated emissions. Um, and so in terms of the main sources of energy, uh, I guess kind of predictably, uh, we found that you know coal and natural gas are still powering a lot of the a lot of the models that are being trained, um, and so 61 uh, of the models from our sample, so almost yeah, so like two thirds, uh, were using coal and natural gas as their main source of energy, and less than a quarter were using low carbon energy sources. Um, and the average carbon intensity of the sample was a little bit less than the global average carbon intensity, which is good but it still kind of shows that there's a lot of progress to be made in terms of renewable energy. And so, you know, people tended to use either what was local to them, which is kind of understandable, but also uh, sometimes like what the default was uh, in terms of uh, like, for example, if they're using a cloud provider, they just pick the, the one that was closest to them without necessarily taking the carbon intensity into account. And this was like before uh, cloud providers actually started um, at least displaying the information. So now they kind of sometimes show that this is like a low carbon instance. But at the time, people like when you'd ask them, they'd say, oh, well, you know, US East was the closest one. And US East is actually pretty high intensity uh, in terms of carbon. And so we found that um, the carbon intensity was pretty high. Um, something that also I wanted to look at just from a, a broader, a broader impacts perspective is like where the models were trained. Um, because, uh, you know, people are working on kind of mapping out a, a machine learning and, and where people are training models. And it was interesting to note that we kind of saw the same pattern as a lot of like scholars uh, in terms of like this global divide phenomenon. So like almost all of our models were tra trained either in North America or Europe. Um, and so like whole continents were missing from our map, essentially Africa and South America are, are not, um, not represented. And we actually did have some authors that were like in those countries, but they would train their models, um, for example, in the US uh, based on a, a cloud provider because they didn't have the, like the compute power that they needed locally. And actually this, 
uh, it, it, this means that you know that they could have like you know longer data processing times, like to to, to transfer the data to like a, a an instance in the U.S. or something, because it, it's actually like further away from them. And so that we really see this global uh, digital divide, and we also see that there's like like the majority is in the U.S. Like 50, 50 of the or forty eight of the models were trained in the U.S. So uh, typical, I guess, also of the of the current uh, power dynamics of our field. And um, in terms of the orders of magnitude, we're actually, um, I guess, pleasantly surprised. Like, so this is a log log scale, but you can still see a, a pretty, pretty <laughs> um, solid pattern uh, that, you know, um, the more energy you consume, the more carbon you emit, generally speaking, but also uh, that there are like pretty big outliers and also that um, the uh, energy uh, source. So whether it was coal or oil or gas or, or hydroelectricity, for example, has a really, really impact. So we can really see kind of like, there's a lot less models that are that are hydroelectricity, but they have a parallel line, like they really follow their own curve. And so um, so we, so this, this does definitely make an impact, especially since we're in log uh, scale, like that's a really big difference between the two curves. Um, and we can we can also see some like outliers at the, at the bottom of the plot that really have like a small uh, energy consumption and a small carbon footprint due to the fact that they're using like almost 100% um, hydroelectricity. Um, so the colors are like the sources of electricity used, but often uh, energy grids have multiple sources. So for example, the, the bigger blue dots have also other, um, other sources of electricity in the mix. That's why the dots are bigger um, than the dots that are like 100% hydro. So for example, in Quebec, where I'm based, we have like 100% hydroelectricity. So the carbon intensity is something like 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, versus, you know, 900 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour in like a coal based, like, like 100% coal based um, energy grid. So it's like a really, really big difference. Um, so we, hey, we Sasha. see. Uh, oh. Sorry, someone has their hand raised. Did you want to take questions during or do you want to take questions just sure. after? Yeah, I just can't see the hand. So. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm happy to moderate. Shrug. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, if you could just go back to the previous slide, the one that talks about global disparity. I mean, I think there are other reasons to explain this, right? Like uh, just by virtue of uh, uh, the, the being close to the equator means that there's going to be more per unit cost that would be required to spend to cool a data center. And it just makes more sense to have data centers that are you know, away from the equator. And then uh, in specifically in the case of India, I mean, if you compare just the cost of real estate between, let's say, places like Canada, Russia, and the US versus India, it just makes so much more sense to not place data centers in India because there's like one twelfth the amount of like per capita land available per per individual. Um, and so I guess there are like other reasons. I wouldn't necessarily call this global disparity as as, as such. Well, if your first point was true, then we would really see more data centers in Norway, Sweden, and uh, or, you know, it would really be far away from the equator, but actually the most powerful, like the most concentrated data centers are like in places like Texas, which are actually quite hot on the global scale. I mean, they're not on the equator, but it's a, it's a, it's a place where uh, it tend, the temperatures tend to rise. So um, as far as I understand the global dynamics of, of data centers, uh, what's more taken into account are things like tax incentives and, um, for example, existing infrastructure. So, like, there's like this data center valley in places like I want to say South Carolina or North Carolina. I never know. U.S. East, like, it has like a huge concentration of uh, data centers from a bunch of different places. It's because they gave tax breaks, and so. Uh, Temperature uh, does have a big impact, but actually, no, it's more of a, a capital uh, aspect. And in terms of um, property prices, I mean, like places like Singapore have pretty big concentration. Like I think Singapore is the biggest concentration of um, servers in, in um, East Asia. And it's one of the highest, like it, one of the most expensive real estate places as well. So I'm not sure that prices in terms of real estate per square kilometer really matter. Um, but yeah, but I see your point that, uh, it's not, I'm not saying it's, it's linked to like, um, income per capita. I'm saying that we just see a, a disparity in terms of like concentration, like power dynamics, like when new data centers are built, 
they're built based on like who could give the biggest tax break and not where do we need more compute power like if that were the case we should be building more data centers in africa and south america and we're not so just it was that was more my point and um there's a lot more work being done on this uh, by people like Abeba Burhan, who actually looks at like where they're built and how they're being built over time, which is which is really interesting. Um, so yeah, so I was saying that uh, so we do see a pattern in terms of uh, more energy equals more carbon, but the the energy source like the power source does matter. And um, I want to take a pause. I, I know that this is only 100 models, but we I mean, it's really hard to get data about uh, training ML models. People kind of think like, I mean, this, this work has already been rejected from conferences like NeurIPS that say this is not representative. Um, it's true that, I mean, it's not representative of machine learning as a whole, but given that we're focusing on specific tasks, um, that, that's why like a lot of the analysis we do are like specifically for image classification or specifically for machine translation. So, um, but if we look at um, the these trends over different tasks, we can see that, um, that they really vary from year to year. And um, even the global average has been kind of oscillating, but there are, um, once again, like these uh, very big systems, especially uh, in natural language processing in recent years that have started kind of like making the average go, go a little bit up. And um, especially for tasks like uh, question answering, machine translation, um, they're really going up um, in terms of like uh, carbon emissions uh, starting in, 2019, which is essentially when the, the BERT paper was, was produced. So like also um, we, were, we were looking at the types of architectures as well. And I mean, it's hard to give categories for all of them because like there are some that are like mixture of experts or, or things like that that are a bit more complex, but we do see that um, like the more transformer models have, have popped up since, since 2019 and they've started dominating the, the rest of the architectures. Um, and in terms of energy uh, and performance, it's really interesting because we try to make Pareto frontiers for each task. Like here, I'm showing two of the tasks, one from NLP, one from uh, computer vision. And so for machine translation, for example, here it's interesting because we have two, two data sets for, for the same task. So it's machine translation, but one of the data sets is bigger and one of the data sets is, is, is smaller. So um, English German. Uh, is smaller. It's kind of the, the bottom curve and English French is bigger and it's like the top shorter curve. And then we can see that um, just based on that, we can see that like the, the models that are trained on the bigger data sets have, have uh, more emissions, but also that there's, there's quite a bit of uh, variability. Like it's not necessarily that just by uh, training a model longer, consuming more energy, you get a better accuracy. So if you're looking at, at blow score, which is typically um, used for machine translation systems. So here there's like more variability. But for uh, image classification on the right, uh, on ImageNet, you can really kind of see this curve of uh, kind of like the, the more um, like intent, energy intensive and uh, carbon intensive systems that have been kind of establishing SOTA um, since, uh, since 2012. So, I mean, depending on the task, the dynamics really are different and it's, um, it's interesting. So we have in our paper, we have all the tasks we look at, but um, here I'm. I'm showing you these these two, and also like you see patterns uh, depending on the the energy, like the main energy source of the of the um, of the training as well. So once again, we see that uh, like hydro is it results in in less uh, in less emissions uh, across the board, and so that's kind of like a pattern we kept seeing. Um, and so in terms of takeaways, um, it was interesting to to gather data about this, and we shared the data, um, and like we're hoping that people will keep contributing to it because once again, it's like we have a Kind of like a, such a lack of knowledge about about these kinds of things and um also people are are, are increasingly begin to, beginning to study things like efficiency um things like you know distillation so it might it would really help to have more data points about like uh distilled versus non-distilled models versus different types of hardware as well as we see like the generations are, are getting more efficient so it would really be great to to gather more information about about this topic in general um and and us in our sample, we did observe that uh, transformer-based models with more layers, so deeper models, tend to be on the higher end of the emission spectrum, and that uh, especially for like NLP tasks, on average, they're they're more energy and carbon intensive. Um, but actually, like to, on this point, um, we struggled a lot with how to um, categorize like uh, pre-trained and fine-tuned models because it's it's actually really hard to say. Well, you know. You train it once and then you fine tune it for different tasks and you, it's hard to um, assign how much energy was used. And so that's why actually a project we're working on with Emma 
is to figure out like if you have a pre-trained model that's later fine-tuned for different tasks, what part of the emissions come from different tasks. So, um, so it's uh, in our study we kind of divided like and however many tasks it was fine-tuned for, but um, you know it, it was probably much more complicated than that depending on the size of the data set and the task itself. So, kind of future work. Um, but what we found in general is that there are like models that were focused on efficiency that were actually um, meant to be kind of more efficient oriented models that uh, did show that it's possible to achieve higher performance with less carbon emissions. So um, we're continuing to, to build this data set and actually like every time I see a, a new paper come out, I try to add to it uh, or ask the authors to. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, you can find it on my GitHub. Um, and so once, when we were working on this project for the last couple of years with my colleague Alex, we also were wondering, um, you know, this, these numbers we were looking at, what, um, what influenced the emissions of these like particular models? And are there ways of actually like taking a model and kind of figuring out where the emissions come from? And so when we were talking to authors or, or corresponding with authors in some cases, they would often um, talk about things like, oh, well, this is like the final training number, but we also did like a lot of experimentation or, um, well, we didn't take into account this or that. And as I said, there's no like single methodology for carbon emissions. So it was sometimes it was hard to figure out, like in our case, we, we focused on like a given number of parameters because that way we can compare different models. But if you had kind of, I say unlimited access to a model, especially a big model, what could you look at in terms of, um, emissions and in terms of energy consumption and like, you know, how could you go deeper? And so um, another project, uh, another another uh, article I want to talk about is um, one that aims to estimate the carbon footprint of Bloom, which is a 176 billion parameter language model. Um, and so I don't know if you all heard of the big science project, I guess it was <laughs> last year, which was a long time ago in machine learning terms, but uh, we had like over a thousand people join us uh, from a bunch of different places. And um, it was, I mean, it was meant to be a, kind of like a, a very community building um, initiative uh, whose end goal was to train a large language model, but that wasn't only focused on that. So we had people working on things like data sourcing, data governance, um, things like, you know, types of evaluation, like bias evaluation, um, also like efficiency and architecture and prompting. Like we had essentially 30 working groups. So 30 separate groups of people working on different aspects of this. And it was really interesting because, uh, you know, it wasn't just like a get to the finish line and train this model situation. It was really more of a, let's take our time. And then the different working groups could also, I mean, did also share um, information and best practices and things like that. And there was actually, you know, a lot of papers published, but also a lot of research artifacts, like a, like a corpus that came out and things like that around this project. So that was really cool. And I was uh, chairing the carbon footprint working group. And when the project started, we were trying to figure out like, well, what could we do that was a little bit more in depth, I guess. And so just to give you an idea, so Bloom at the time was kind of the biggest um, accessible model. I mean, <laughs> the biggest model for which there was information. Um, since, that, since then, models have gotten bigger, but you know, we were still kind of 176 billion parameters, which was bigger than GPT-3, for example. And um, so, yeah, so the acronym stands for Big Science, Large Open Science, <laughs> Open Access Multilingual Model. Um, and what was great is that we got um, a computing grant from um, a French uh, supercomputer but also that they gave us uh, support. So it wasn't just like credits. It wasn't just like hours. It was more like support and they helped us make it run more efficiently, the model run more efficiently. And they also helped us you know, debug things and, and uh, do experiments in terms of the um, energy consumption of the model. So I'll, I'll talk about that later. But what was cool is that often if you're training just like on a commercial cloud platform, you don't have access to, to the underlying hardware. You can't measure the energy that you're consuming. You can't like, shut off a GPU to see how much energy that GPU was consuming. So you can't do all these different kind of little experiments, but with uh, Jean Zé, which was like a computing cluster, we could do all sorts of cool stuff. And they also gave us a million hours of compute to train the model. So that was pretty cool. Um, so how about the carbon footprint? Um, and so we went back and forth about this a lot and uh, we didn't want to just measure the training footprint, which is what people did and what, what we did in our, in our, in our study. That was kind of the, 
the easy way out. Um, and I talked to my friends kind of more in sustainability and they told me about a uh, life cycle assessment. So that's kind of the go-to approach for measuring the environmental impacts of products. So anything from, you know, a hamburger to a bicycle to, a, I don't know, a piece of clothing like jeans or something, people work on figuring out its life cycle assessment. Uh, and so what that means is that they look at the whole kind of life cycle from the raw uh, extraction of materials to the disposal and end of life. And this is actually really hard to do in a lot of cases, because especially if products are complex, like electronics, um, there's a lot of different components. There's transportation, there's, uh, you know, all sorts of different parts. And um, in order to get each one of these numbers in terms of the, the carbon emitted during each of the processes, you really need to like go to the providers and figure out what they're doing. So for Bloom, so for machine learning models in general, we try to hone in on three kind of steps in that process, the steps in green. So for raw material extraction, sadly, we couldn't get access to the people mining, um, actually the rare metals used in, uh, in, in creating GPUs. Um, materials manufacturing as well, it's a pretty complex, it's like industrial processes, but we started with equipment manufacturing, um, then we looked at some model training, which is like uh, what people looked at in general, then model deployment, and for AI actually disposal end of life is actually pretty hard, I mean, it's, it's, it's to be discussed whether there is really like a disposal process for ML models, so we just focused on, on those three steps. Um, but in, in, even for them, it was really, really hard to get data. So starting with the equipment, um, most of the GPUs we use for training AI models are made by NVIDIA, but NVIDIA doesn't actually publish any of their lifecycle assessments, but HPE does. And HPE makes, um, you know, also they make GPUs and CPUs and they make servers and stuff like that. And so what we were able to do is we were, um, so yeah, so, so these are the emissions that are associated with like all the different components of any of any computing infrastructure or a product. And so HP actually does really, really detailed analyses like this one where they say, well, this is like this model of, of server or computer. And then here are like the kilos of CO2 that are uh, emitted by each one of the components, which is really interesting. And so, um, so for example, this, this HP 2021 server emits 2,500 kilograms of CO2 just for like one single um, server being created. Um, and the way that uh, life cycle assessment looks at it is like, well, the manufacturing is upfront. It's a one-time kind of um, cost, but then you uh, spread it over the time in which the equipment is used. And so that's why um, there's like all these debates. I mean, if you wanna go into all these debates about like plastic bags versus like cotton totes, because cotton totes use a lot of, um, actually water and, 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 but they are used over more time and plastic is cheaper or, or less intensive, but it's like, it's single use. And so there's all sorts of debates like this. And so uh, particular for computer products or for, for uh, electronics, um, usually it's the case. You, you take the um, upstream cost and you divide it by how, by how long you use it for. And so um, since training an AI model like Bloom uses hundreds of servers in parallel, uh, this can really add up to tons of CO2. And so what we did is we took uh, several kind of models from HPE and we uh, like reverse engineered all the different components and we looked at the uh, NVIDIA GPUs we were using and we, we matched like on average, uh, you know, these are the components in the HP, HPE servers. This is what it would correspond to in the, in the NVIDIA servers. And we did like a matching and um, like we weren't able to get the exact confirmation from NVIDIA, but we, we could like go down to like the hardware level and figure out what the equivalences were. Um, and so uh, Jean Zé told us that they replace their GPUs every six years and on average they're used 85% of the time, which is was, which was cool that they, they told us this. And this actually translates into 0 0.05 kilos of CO2 for each hour of server time and 0 0.003 kilograms of CO2 for each hour of GPU time. So, um, and, and since we had 1.08 million hours and we had 384 GPUs and 48 nodes, we could like do all the math and we figured out that that added 11 tons of CO2 to our, like on top of any kind of training emissions that we had. So um, once again, this is an estimate, but it was interesting because we could really, um, you know, connect with the people who built the cluster and they gave us all the, all the, all the blueprints and things like that. And we were able to go kind of deep into the, into the weeds of the, of the manufacturing. Um, something else that we wanted to look at was idle versus dynamic power consumption, because um, if you're running a process in your computer, you can definitely track like 
NVIDIA SMI, for example, for your GPU usage. But on top of that, like there's uh, energy being consumed to uh, power your screen or uh, or your I don't know your uh, your mouse and your keyboard and things like that. Well, same thing goes for cluster. There's a lot of overhead in the computing cluster that's above and beyond just the GPUs. And so we wanted to quantify that. And so um, what we did is we ran a series of experiments with Jean Zay actually, uh, which was really cool. So they shut off parts of the cluster and we measured the energy consumption when, depending on what was shut off. And so for example, um, infrastructure mode was like when the computing nodes were, were turned off, but the network storage and cooling were turned on, we could measure the power consumption. And then there was idle mode when the compute modes were on, but not running. And then we also had like the actual um, consumption of the nodes. So we had like these three numbers that we could compare. Um, and we found that uh, the dynamic power consumption, so like really what the GPUs were consuming was only about half of the total power consumption. So uh, if you add infrastructure and idle, this actually like adds up uh, almost double to um, the, the overall consumption of the, of the hardware and stuff like that. And that's interesting because once again, all the work done so far has only really focused on the dynamic consumption. It didn't really look at the overhead or or, or very um, briefly looked at like things like uh, the efficiency of the, um, of the servers. So in this case, we looked at that as well and we, and we found some interesting numbers. And so essentially, if you look at the carbon footprint of blue, uh, we had 25 tons of dynamic consumption. We had 11 tons of idle consumption and 14 tons of embodied emissions. Um, and if we wanted to look at like the big science project in general, uh, we could also get the logs for all the processes that the, all the working groups ran over the, over the time that we had access to Jean Zay. And so um, we found that it also doubled the compute time. So we had like 1 million hours for training the model and um, we had almost um, double that in terms of, um, so this is like, this is like actual training of, of the blue model, the 176 billion parameter. And then there's all these other uh, trainings of smaller models that we're building up to the final model to like check, uh, you know, stability and things like that. So there was a bunch of like smaller models that were trained. There was the evaluation of the model. Um, there was like tokenization and data processing and whatnot. And once you add all of that up, you know, you go from 25 tons of CO2 to 66 tons. So you really kind of it really blows it up. And actually, uh, at the same time we were working on this, the um, OPT paper came out, came out from Meta. And they've also found that like the experimentation doubled their emissions, but they didn't kind of do the different categories that we did. So this is interesting because hopefully, you know, when people start uh, doing these kinds of measurements for, for their own project, they can also see like what part of uh, the project um, consume the most energy and, and, um, and generate the most emissions. Um, and now for inference, this is like my, my new interest, I guess, my, my new uh, shiny new uh, interest that, I, that I'm really particularly curious about because um, this article that keeps getting cited is that uh, NVIDIA announced it was like, it was like a blog post or something and that 80 to 90% of their workload is inference. Um, and all the numbers we have is, is about, are about model training. So we don't know anything about inference. Um, and um, nobody until until we started working on Bloom, no one really looked at inference for, for large language models. And so what we did is um, we deployed Bloom for like two weeks or something or three weeks. And um, we let people query it like it was an API uh, that people could query. And then we measured the energy consumption, uh, the power of, of, the, um, of the GPU during the, that whole time. And um, we also tried to see like, you know, how many how many queries were coming in, uh, you know, how often and things like that. So it was interesting. Yeah, so it was from September 23rd to October 11th of last year. And we found that on average, I mean, with this kind of like very, very variable uh, load, uh, it was deploying about 19 kilos of carbon a day when it was deployed um, in US East, which has like the most uh, GPUs of um, from the Google Cloud Platform. And uh, this is like one model, right? This is one model that's deployed kind of just in real time, there was like just a queue that if like too many people were querying it, they would just have to wait. So that doesn't take into account things like people do, like you know, like Kubernetes and scaling, and you know, if you can imagine all the all the copies of ChatGPT that are running in parallel in order to respond to millions of user queries. So 
uh, this kind of shows that if you have a model that is running in, 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 and also you can't really optimize inference as much as training, right? Because you sometimes you have a lot of queries, sometimes you have none. So you're constantly like shifting the load. You can't really do batching. You can't really do all sorts of stuff that people do to make training very optimal and to make sure that they're utilizing their, their GPU at 100%. You can't really do a lot of these things for inference. And so inference is actually kind of like the elephant in the room in the sense that it consumes quite a bit of energy, just like Oh yeah, the red line and the red dotted line is like the energy that you need to to keep like your model in in memory and 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 active because you can never really shut it down. It always has to be has to be on, and so it's constantly like it is consuming energy, uh, no matter what. Um, and so we also did a comparison with a couple of other models that came out in at the same time, not to say <laughs> who was better, but kind of to see what the factors were that influenced um, the overall carbon footprint. And what we found that of course, uh, Bloom, since it was trained in France, it was nuclear energy, so that gave it like a huge um, leg up. But for example, OPT, that came out uh, pretty much at the same time, they were much more efficient, I mean, relatively more efficient to train their model, but they still had a, a, a bigger carbon footprint. Um, and like previous models um, were kind of doubly penalized because they took, they had more power consumed during training and um, a higher carbon intensity of the energy grid, which resulted in like, 20 times more um, more emissions for GPT-3 compared to Blue. Um, but in general, this kind of shows that the when you're talking about millions of GPU hours, the, the carbon intensity really matters. Um, and oh yeah, PUE is, uh, is, is the efficiency of the data centers, which, which, which actually is gotten quite good. So it has a, a less of a less, less of an impact, but, but still it's one of the one of the factors that, that we looked at. Um, all this to say is that, yeah, we're getting a better idea of AI's true carbon footprint, but there's a lot, um, a lot to figure out. So um, what was interesting with Bloom is that we did have access to all these different aspects of model training, which let us do all sorts of studies. But um, it's true that, you know, when people are training models on the cloud, they don't necessarily have that level of granularity. So uh, it would be even more useful to give people ideas like that they could predict in, in advance without you know having access to the underlying energy consumption like if you have a, a, a model with this many parameters uh this long training time you can help people like kind of predict their carbon footprint so that's what we're working on now is, is to figure out like formulas or estimations that people can use when when they don't have access to the details that we do like for example the fact that like overhead on a on a big uh, supercomputer is like double what your gpu is consuming that's kind of like a good idea to give you know people that um like meta information and same thing for experimentation experimentation is, is usually double of what like the final training is, is uh, consuming um there's also like a general lack of methodology uh, for comparing the carbon emissions of ML models, which I think is something that we could work towards as well. And um, hopefully more transparency with regards to like the rest of the model life cycle would be really useful because like we went back and forth with uh, uh, NVIDIA for like a really long time <laughs> about uh, where the where their emissions are coming from. And and finally, like we didn't get any answers. So that would I think that getting more information about that is really is really useful as well, especially that GPUs are like there's getting more and more people are using more and more GPUs, so that really adds up. If you're if you're training on like 400 GPUs for I don't know a million hours, that's like a really long time. Um, oh yeah, and, and inference is is like as I said, kind of the next frontier, and that's what we're working on at Hugging Face now, um, looking at different models and, and how their and how their energy consumption changes um, during inference. Um, and so, last um, kind of general topic I wanted to talk about is, is like the broader societal impact of ML models because I'm convinced that I mean it's great to focus on sustainability but we focus we, we function in a society and I mean it's great to ask everyone to be carbon neutral or sustainable or whatnot but you know we are constrained by by society in, in, in at, at large and so at um yeah this is mostly ongoing work so I'm not going to give you any answers but um, we do have an ethics and society team at Hugging Face, which uh, who, who tried to work on different aspects of, of societal impacts. And so we have people working on policy, on ethics, on um, legal affairs, uh, which is actually a really big thing as well. Like you want to you want to do X, but, you know, the law says something else or, or the law doesn't exist. In the case of AI, it's mostly that the law doesn't exist. Um, and so we have people are, who are looking at uh, different parts of this. And so um, and so I'll, I'll present some of the projects that we've been working on and how they kind of fit into the in, into the big picture. 
Um, and the first pro project I want to talk about is um, one called Bugs in the Data. And it's interesting because it's not, it's not really a sustainability project as such, but it's like, I guess, more AI oriented. And so um, what we did is we, we realized, um, so this was with David Rolnick, who's a professor here at McGill. We realized that a third of the ImageNet, um, like the object recognition channels a challenge, so like the ImageNet 1K, a third of the categories are actually animals. Um, and then David, uh, he's, he's like really great at uh, identifying all sorts of animals, especially like insects and, and reptiles and stuff like that. And so we were looking at these images with him and he's like, wait a minute, like none of these are right. <laughs> so we were like, hey, well, why don't we look at these 269 classes um, and figure out like how good they are essentially. Because the thing is with ImageNet is that people are using this to benchmark their AI systems, their ML systems. And then as, as well, we talk to like people who are like in biodiversity monitoring and they're using ImageNet trained models in their like applications, like for, you know, camera trap data and stuff like that. And so it's like this, this, these kinds of problems can actually have an impact on things beyond uh, like the AI community. And so um, we focused just on the wild animals and we actually um, asked 20 ecologists from different um, backgrounds. So we had people who were like primatologists, uh, we had like uh, ornithologists, we had all sorts of like experts looking at these images um, and looking at the classes themselves. And it was a really cool project because we found that there were classes that had like 98% incorrect images, like 98%. Um, and uh, I mean, this depended really on the on the type of um, of, of uh, I mean, like the taxonomy. Like, for example, there were more uh, reptiles and amphibians that were incorrect than like birds and fish. But still, like the fact that ninety eight percent of images of black footed ferrets were not actual black footed ferrets uh, was pretty mind blowing. Um, and the sources of error, well, like most of the I mean, actually, ImageNet was created by my mechanical Turk workers who obviously didn't have like taxonomic expertise, so. Um, often they would kind of either use uh, an example image or they would do an image search in order to figure out if that's what they were looking at. Also, um, for, for things like um, black-footed ferrets and rock, rock crabs, it's actually kind of like a, a semantic error. So like black-footed ferrets are not actual, I mean, they're not, they don't actually have black feet in real life. They just called black and ferrets. Um, and, but the images were of ferrets with black feet. And so there was like this confusion. Same thing with like rock cra crabs their type of crab, not a crab on a rock. And the same thing with like a green snake or a grass snake. Anyway, so there's a lot of like, just because the way they were named is silly. So people just did poor identification, I guess. We also find, found a geographical bias of like the kinds of species that were represented in ImageNet. So um, species from like uh, the United States and Europe were like overrepresented with regards to like how much they represent true biodiversity, especially for birds. So like 58% of the images are US birds, but US birds are only 8% of like world total birds. Uh, same thing with Europe. Um, and, and this is probably because, um, you know, people creating these images knew these species. They knew a bald eagle, they knew a blue jay, but they didn't really know birds from other continents. And so they, they, they made these classes based on things they knew, which results in a very, once again, global North uh, centric data set. Um, and so why does this matter? Well, the fact is, is that um, we're, first of all, we're evaluating accuracy on a data set that's at least, at least the third we were looking at doesn't, I mean, is incorrect in a lot of cases, right? Like uh, overall. Um, and so some people are, are using also these categories to test few shot learning, zero shot learning, but actually like you can't, you can't use black-footed ferrets as a as a test case for any kind of model just because the model the the, the images are so mislabeled. Um, and also, uh, as people are pre-training on ImageNet more and more, and and you know, um, in ImageNet 21K, there's a, like a huge portion of uh, biodiversity categories as well, um, which would be interesting to test on. But there's like a lot of them. As, so that would be kind of the next step. Um, but so yeah, so people are using these uh, these data sets to train models that are then deployed in the real world, which obviously perpetuate these kinds of errors and biases. Um, and I, I guess Jesse talked about this project last week, so I'm not going to talk about it um, very much this week. Uh, he he warned me that uh, um, that he would uh, kind of go into more detail. But um, this is another project that we worked on. Uh, I guess for those of you who who missed last week's lecture about uh, about how um, energy sources um, impact uh, carbon emissions. And so 
people we uh, collaborated with folks from Azure and folks from um, Allen AI Institute and we kind of looked at like depending on where you train models and depending on how you, how you train models and when you train models um, the ensuing emissions and so I guess in a nutshell um, we looked at the emissions of different models and how they like compare um, so like uh, you know a six billion parameter transformer could is is uh, represents like a yearly home energy use, even if it's only trained at 13%, which is which is pretty pretty uh, pretty wild. Um, and then uh, we looked at different techniques of optimization. So, for example, um, deciding when you start and start and stop training a model, and depending on like the, I guess to to, to back up a bit, um, emissions do vary over time uh, in energy grids. So, especially if you're using like solar energy or um, or wind energy. Um, it will vary depending on you know what's what's available, and so if you if you start and stop at certain times that where there's a lot of like sun, for example, uh, the emissions can be very low. But then if um, you continue training into the night where people are using I don't know, a diesel generator, then the emissions go up. And so we were looking at uh, like changing the, the the training time in order to um, optimize right. Uh, the, for carbon emissions. And so if you're flexible over 24 hours, which more, most people are, you can really uh, reduce emissions by like 25% uh, by honing in on the specific time where emissions are lowest. Um, and another uh, technique that uh, works is also pause and resume with the, with the same uh, logic, right? You, the emissions are going up, so you pause your model training and then when they go back down, you continue training it again. Um, and then at also, um, uh, really reduces emissions a lot and is, is quite flexible, right? You don't need, you, you can kind of do it automatically based on a threshold um, where you kind of say if it's above the threshold, you stop, and if it's below, you continue training. So, yeah, I'm not going to go into much detail about this. I actually like to quit <laughs> much of my slides, but I mean, this is kind of um, for me, this project was uh, unique because we actually worked with people from cloud providers and they gave us access to like information about um, like this about like all these different regions and their emissions. And actually it's interesting because as a consumer, you rarely get like this kind of insight into like these commercial cloud platforms. So the folks at Azure was, were really great about like being very forthcoming about um, the, the energy, uh, the, the carbon intensity of, of the energy we were using. And so um, <laughs> I guess if we wanna make the parallel with current events, um, since a lot of the very big models currently being trained are being trained on Azure. <laughs> it's good to know um, that there are like particular regions that are more um, low carbon and also that the folks working there have this on their on their radar. And, um, and so one can one can hope that um, that this kind of research because it's done in collaboration with companies as opposed to kind of conflict, um, that it could also help them get more kind of information like actionable information for their own um, internal practices, because I mean, typically I find that the work I do often comes to is often at odds with um, like big tech companies because you know we're kind of trying to figure out, uh, for example, or even like Nvidia, like we spent six months going back and forth about uh, about their emissions and like how much each GPU um, like costs in terms of energy, carbon, and stuff like that. And finally, it was just too sensitive a subject, right? Because it was sensitive information. Um, and so working with a, a company like this was really kind of <laughs> optimistic. I mean, for me, give me optimism that there are ways to work with um, companies that do have business interests, but like could, you can find kind of like a common middle ground that, um, that's useful. So for me, this project kind of brought um, brought to mind that we can also work with, with bigger tech companies and, and cloud providers. And the final thing I, um, I want to talk about is like the, is a as a Hugging Face specific project that I'm working on um, because I don't know if you know Hugging Face very well, but it's a hub for sharing uh, AI models and data sets. Mostly, that's kind of like its first um, re raison d'etre for this why it exists. And so, um, to date, it wasn't really exploited by the sustainability community. And so now we're trying to build bridges with different. The thing is with the climate change community um, is that there's a lot of different subgroups. And so there are people who are working on energy systems, energy grids, there are people who are working on methane detection, there are people who are working on biodiversity monitoring. And so it's really hard to say, well, like, this is going to help everyone because everyone has their own, um, I guess, uh, 
you know, problems or, or they need different solutions. And so as climate lead at Hugging Face, I'm trying to find ways of like helping or using the existing stuff we have at Hugging Face that helps these, um, these different sub communities within, within the climate community. And so in this case, we were working with um, camera trap data sets, which are actually like really widely used. And um, I kind of, as, as a, a kind of a personal story, once I, I went to Costa Rica and I was staying on, a, on like a research uh, with a research lab, like in the middle of the jungle there essentially. And they spent a crazy amount of time going through their camera trap images and like filtering out black, uh, blank images, which are like 90% of images are, are actually just like false. Like they're triggered by, by movement, but sometimes it's like a branch or something, right? And so they spent crazy amounts of time filtering those out, which obviously AI can do. They spent a, a crazy amount of time um, trying to identify the animals, um, trying to uh, like connect data sets between different sources. So like Costa Rica and Mexico and Guatemala might all have like research centers about the same things. and. It would be great to connect the different data sources. And so there's a lot of kind of like, there's a lot of work that's being done, but a lot of it is manual. And so also accessing labeled data, it can be a challenge because often they don't have these like huge storages or they don't, they can't really download all, a lot of data and um, establishing common categories that, that, that transfer uh, across different sources because you know, I mean, if you remember your biology class, you know, there's a whole taxonomy of species and it would be really great to know that I don't know, like Asian elephants uh, and African elephants, right? Like have similar patterns or whatever. But in order to do that, you need to kind of go up uh, and connect the different groups. It's not enough to have a flat structure. You need a hierarchical structure. To, to establish that structure is really, really hard for these kinds of biodiversity monitoring uh, efforts. And so uh, our goal uh, is, is if we start providing and hosting labeled data, this can help conservation scientists who can just use the data that we're hosting to create their own specific uh, context applications, but also machine learning researchers like uh, now we're working um, on, a, on a project to train like an ImageNet type model, but for camera trap data. And that obviously like needs the uh, buy-in of ML researchers, but it's also interesting because it's like a new data set, you can test new things, right? Like, it's not ImageNet that everyone's used 55,000 times, and then um, it's been found to have a lot of discrepancies. And so we're also trying to get the ML community involved and, and do like hackathons and competitions and stuff. Um, and so we have a data set called uh, Lila, which is essentially camera trap data from a bunch of different sources. So like something like 30 or 40 different like places where the data comes from. And so first we spent a lot of time establishing a, a taxonomy and um, kind of essentially standardizing and structuring the data um, centrally. And what's cool with uh, Hugging Face data sets is that um, like you not only have the back end where you can kind of load the, load the data easily, but you also have the front end where that shows you like what the task is and where it comes from and stuff like that. And actually uh, a big part of this, a big part of our, our kind of job at Hugging Face is, is, is uh, documentation. So model cards and data cards uh, are kind of like the, the standard that we adhere to. And so for example, for Lila, we wrote a whole like data set card describing each of the ecosystems, uh, each of the sources, like even like the cameras that they use to capture the data because those also differ. And uh, to provide like contact points, if you wanna know more about like, uh, I don't know, for example, Missouri cam camera traps, like here's the person who created this data set because they're all kind of like from different sources. And all of them use a common taxonomy, which we defined with like the people, like the biologists who created the data, which is really cool. And why is this useful? So um, it makes the data sets easier to share before they were on like on a um, Dropbox or something. <laughs> they were on some like really kind of hard to access uh, and you needed to download like the whole zip file and then like figure out what the structure is. Whereas um, on Hugging Face, you have like, they're all already there and they're you can you can you can get like a subset or you can get like you can even filter by uh, location or filter by species like there's a lot of built in functions that really helps you work with the data set. Um, you don't need to locally download it, download it, and you can also easily use it to train transformer models because obviously like the connection between data sets and models is, is done um, automatically. And so, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, we're training like this. First, we actually trained a detector model for empty images, which are which are like a huge problem for, for uh, biodiversity monitoring. And now we're working on like this big taxonomy um, model. But the thing is, is like, obviously some classes are overrepresented and underrepresented. Um, you know, some class, some the animals like are very similar. So it's actually really hard to train like a single model for all of these different classes in all of these different um, environments. And um, so we're looking at like hierarchical labels. We're working on. We're, we're looking at like balancing the classes and stuff like that. Because 
you need kind of a, a more, um, yeah, in order to train like a, I don't know how many classes there are in total, but uh, it's close to ImageNet, it's like 18,000 or something. So you, you need to be really careful about how you balance your data. Um, and also uh, we're doing a lot of tutorials and workshops with, um, for example, cons conservationists and, and people like biologists and stuff like that to help them. Because like also you can use these data sets like just via the UI, you don't necessarily need to write code. And so we're also trying to help them like just learn how to use these tools without necessarily being like super, super familiar with computers. And also uh, my, my personal favorite thing on, on, on Hugging Face are demos. And so we have a thing called Spaces and essentially it allows you to take a data set um, and take either a model or, um, I mean, you can fine tune the model and the data set or you can essentially you can connect models and data sets and make like interactive demos. And so <laughs> um, we have a couple of other like um, 